here. And so uh, this text uh, today, um, <laughs> it's been called some of Jesus's hardest calls to discipleship. Um, last week, we talked about the effects of pride and humility. And there's a reason uh, that Jesus talked so much about humility and how important it is. Because without humility, we can't do what he's getting ready to command us to do in this next section of scripture, which we're going to finish up chapter 9, verses 42 through 50 today uh, of Mark. And the, the issue is, is we can't become proud when we, when we see spiritual movement, uh, when we see people come to Christ, when we see life change, we got to make sure that we understand that has nothing to do with us other than our obedience. Uh, because the moment that we think we have some power, the Lord may see fit to humiliate us, to make sure that we understand and have a clear understanding we have no power, none. Remember, Christ followers in and of themselves have zero power. We have Holy Spirit residing in us. And when we abide in Christ and we have the right heart and the right mind and the right obedience, then God chooses to move. But he may remove that to humble us, sometimes to humiliate us for his glory and our good. And that's what uh, Jesus is talking about. So again, today, you'll remember he referenced a child. Today, he's going uh, to reference back to a child. And he calls for the best word I can use to describe this is radical. It's radical what Jesus says. I cannot even begin to imagine what the apostles were thinking when Jesus says what he says in these next nine or 10 verses. I, I, I can't even imagine. Because remember the shift in his ministry. He's focusing intently and he's given the, the apostles extreme, severe, revolutionary teaching on what it truly means to be a Christ follower. And so we're gonna learn four things that Jesus commands his followers, notice I said to be. I didn't say to do, to be. And the first one's radically loving. Now, when you saw that video, it was loving, wasn't it? And yes, that is important. But this is not the kind of loving we're gonna talk about uh, today. We're gonna talk about uh, the believers. Jesus calls for a radical love uh, with each other within uh, the church. And when I say the church, Remember last week, that's not just Hendersonville Church. That's the like-minded churches that are all in Henderson County, North Carolina, Southeast, United States, to the ends of the earth. Remember that. I'm not discounting church hurt, but I'm just saying it's a bride of Christ. He's talking about the capital C church. Now listen to this first verse. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, he's talking about Christ followers, to sin, we're gonna unpack that word sin right there. It would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. These are the words of Jesus. Now a millstone uh, was this circular rock that was about this high in diameter. Uh, there was a wooden shaft put through it and then it was set on top of another rock and they would put olives on it. And they would, and a donkey would, would turn around and that millstone was, like I said, about that big and it weighed between three, four, sometimes 5,000 pounds. Jesus wanted to prove a point, if we cause one of another Christ followers to sin, he says it's better for us to have one of those tied around our neck and thrown overboard into the sea. Wow. <laughs> now, what exactly does this mean? Well, here's the thing. A major theme of the New Testament. Again, remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about descriptive and prescriptive. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts are main. Now, they're, this is prescriptive, but they're mainly descriptive. The letters that people, especially in the modern church, do not think are anywhere near as attractive as the Gospels and Acts, they have a constant theme in them, Romans through Jude. Listen, th that sin has the power to absolutely destroy the spiritual and the moral health of a church and the individuals who commit the sin. We've got to look at this radically, folks, revolutionary, extreme. The letters are filled the letters, the epistles to the church are filled with directions and directives and commands to eradicate sin in the church. It's why church discipline and self-discipline are so important and honor God. They honor God. He honors that. When we do church discipline, by the way, for a church to be healthy, you know what it's gotta have? Conflict. If it doesn't have conflict, it can't be healthy. If none of us were sinners, we wouldn't need conflict. If we were all Jesus, we wouldn't have any conflict. We all sinners, every one of us. There must 
be conflict, healthy conflict, Christ-exalting, God-honoring, God-glorifying conflict in order for a church to maintain its health. I hope everybody realizes that. Huge mistake we can make. Oh, I know they're mad at each other. Let's put them over there. Oh, I know they're mad at each other. Put you over here. That grieves the Holy Spirit. We've, we've talked about that. Jesus warned we must not cause people to stumble. Remember, we learned last week, whatever you do to a Christ follower, you do to Christ. So if you're bitter towards a Christ follower, guess what? You're bitter towards Christ. Even at that church across the street. If you're bitter towards them, you're bitter towards Christ. Now this word sin is where we get our, our word scandal. And, and, and it's hard to translate. Some, some translations say stumble. Some say stumble into sin. Uh, but it means to cause to sin, to stumble or fall into a trap with a snare. It was used of, 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 a, of a hunter when he would put something in front of a common path for an animal they wanted to catch and it got into a snare. He would use this same scandalizo. I don't know if that's right or not. But anyway, not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the means. But that, that's, that's what that word meant, to cause to be brought to a downfall. So it's necessary we unpack this verse to understand the ways we as Christ followers cause other Christ followers to sin. And really, there's four different ways. And, and I'm, I've, I've structured them in the, in the order of easiest to understand and, and probably to avoid, down to the hardest to avoid. Because the hardest one to avoid requires humility. And it's, listen, it's not, oh, well, you know, I'm not, no, 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 get, just get ready, okay? Direct temptation. So if I'm gossiping about somebody and I call somebody over and say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? I'm immediately putting them in a situation where they can stumble into sin of gossip. Or if I'm watching something on a computer screen and I'm trying to get somebody else to look at it with me, uh, that's another way. If I'm cheating on something and ask someone to participate in the cheating of it, I am causing them through direct temptation to stumble. Well, Nathan, that, that seems pretty clear. Yeah, I, I get it. Here's the next one. Indirect temptation. Uh, this is a perfect example of this. Again, we just talked about how, how God loves the family. And so Paul is teaching the church in Ephesus uh, basically from Ephesians 5, 21 uh, through midway through chapter six, he's talking about the family and the, and the relationship of the employee and boss. And he gives the fathers a directive and, and that helps shed light on this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So with my kids, if I fail to ever show them compassion, if I fail to ever tell them I love them, if I give them standards that are unattainable, or if I'm constantly just on them, or I refuse to forgive them, or if I refuse to ask for their forgiveness when I mess up. Dads, your kids will never forget when you ask them for their forgiveness. They'll never forget. They won't. I've learned that. I need to do it a lot more often. But you provoke your children. What he's talking about, this is an unrighteous anger a sinful anger. And so when you do something like that, you're provoking someone through an indirect temptation to potentially sin. Okay, well, I think I understand that one, Nathan. And again, if you don't understand any of these, please fill out a care card. I'd love to have a conversation with you because listen, it gets a lot harder and a lot more offensive. A lot more, get ready. By failing to encourage righteousness. Are you sharpening your brothers and sisters in Christ? When you're with your brothers and sisters in Christ and a crude joke comes up, what do you do? You laugh at it or do you try to steer them away? When you see the conversation starting to get close to gossip, what do you do? Oh, really? Tell me some more. What, what are you doing? And here's the thing. The scriptures, are, are they're clear on this, y'all. The writer of Hebrews hits this home beautifully. In Hebrews 10, remember, he says, not many, we shouldn't fail to gather. And so we need to gather. By the way, we are here to glorify God. That's the only reason we're here, point glory to God, to worship him. That is the reason we exist, is to point glory to God. We learn in our men's group, what's your goal? Because that will determine everything. That'll determine how you define success. That'll be what you're focused on, and that will give you your perspective. It will. But listen to Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love 
and good works. Now, the Greek here is beautiful. First off, that word consider means to give careful consideration, direct one's whole mind toward. I, I, was, I was studying this. I was like, man, when's the last time I've actually sat down and I've directed my whole mind, hey, God, help me to understand, to, to, to literally, anytime I'm with people, to help direct them and encourage righteousness. Not in, a, not in a goody-goody type of way, not in a legalistic type of way, but in a loving type of way. Because without giving it careful consideration, you're gonna do it wrong anyway. You're gonna take the Bible and hit them across the face with it. No one's ever been coerced or angered into heaven, ever. And so, but it, are, you, is it, are you even contemplating it and asking the Holy Spirit when you're at the workplace or you're, or you're with some people? I mean, this, this is very, very important. Let us consider to immerse ourselves in the thought of how we can do that. Stir up to cause a movement or change of position to disturb the quiet of. It was used uh, for Roman soldiers when they would spur their horses. Same Greek. Some, matter of fact, some translations, I think, say spur one another on to love and good works. So how are we as a body encouraging righteousness in order to prevent our brothers and sisters from stumbling into the trap and the snare of sin when you're with a group. Now here's where it gets tricky <laughs> because now we're moving beyond to where, honestly, uh, you, you, you gotta be a mature Christ follower to start understanding this, but we gotta teach it. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit through the, through the preaching of his word, because we got a lot of scripture we're getting ready to cover, a lot. As a matter of fact, the majority of the words that are gonna come out of my mouth now are gonna be from the word of God and not me. You're like, well, thank goodness, that's good. I agree. So this is where it gets after the point of Jesus's radical, revolutionary, extreme, unheard of love, okay? By placing a stumbling block before them, okay? Now, <laughs> this is why pride is so destructive, not only of the self, but of the church, Outright sin is not the only danger to the church. Although it's not sin in and of itself, a certain attitude or a certain behavior, it can destroy fellowship. It can, caused by differences between Christians over matters that are neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture. And this is where the humility kicks in. This is where it kicks in because a matter of special preference or historic uh, tradition, if we take that and we impose that on others, it can lead to strife and disunity and make, folks, listen, the scriptures are clear. God, it enrages God when there's disunity in his body. It enrages him when there's disunity in his body. Every church, the smallest of churches, the largest of churches have differences in, in age and in education and maturity, personalities, culture. Every church has differences. Some members may come from a long line of evangelicals. Some members may have just come, just recently been saved from a cult. Some are used to a very liturgical, uh, planned out, thought out, calm, uh, liturgical worship. Others may come from a worship that's more spontaneous. Again, we're not talking about issues that are in and of themselves sin. We've got to make sure we understand this. We've got some in here who have been to, exposed to biblical teaching their whole life. We've got some in here, who, who, and it's okay, that don't know a lot of the core tenets of Scripture. It's okay. It's okay. And so it's, 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 God never, never intended for there to be uniformity in the church. He never intended for that. He intended there to be unity. In a matter of fact, we're gonna learn what caused the explosion in the early church. It was not the power of the miracles. It was the unity of people who could not be more different. These Jews and these Gentiles who hated each other for thousands of years were worshiping together. And people said, I want that. How is that possible? It requires the Holy Spirit, which equates to humility. Because, well, they just need to get over it is not what Jesus wants. And Jesus can't stand that. When you look at the past three years, there has been a ton of disagreement within the church over certain things. A ton that are not sin issues. 
And again, we're talking about the most distinguishing quality of the church that led to the explosion of the church was unity of the believers. And it's clear when we're unified, God draws them in. God makes them. God saves them. The numbers day by day, those who are being saved, it's all, again, I'll say it. Some of you don't like it when I say it. These empty seats are not my problem. They're not. When we are unified and we are building this body up in love, God will bring people. I talk to people all the time. Well, how'd you get here? Well, I just drove by and feel like coming in. Oh, okay. God does it all. He does it all. Our job is unity and purity. Now, I'm going to read a couple of long sections of Scripture that help really hit this home. There was a massive issue with meat offered to idols back in the New Testament. And it's something that we cannot possibly appreciate. I would have to literally unpack it for over an hour for us to, to appreciate it. But here's the deal. God, in the Levitical law, we're not talking about what we've talked about before with the Pharisees' oral law. We're talking about in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law that God Almighty gave prohibited the eating of meat offered to idols and certain other meats. Well, you had the Gentiles eating meat left, right, and sideways, okay? Well, they would come to Christ and it was a stumbling block to them, okay? And some of the Jews realized, well, there are no other gods. It doesn't even matter because Jesus fulfilled it. It's all fulfilled in Jesus, all the ceremonial law, not the moral law. Jesus made the moral law harder, okay? But the, the ceremonial law, Jesus fulfilled all that. And so there was this massive tension, even with the apostles at one point, where, where Paul has to, has to correct Peter about eating meat. And so I just want to read the two sections, are 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14. And again, get ready to get uncomfortable because you've got to humble yourself. And if you can't humble yourself, you got a big problem. And so it says this, Paul's teaching them. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. <laughs> Be careful, but love builds up. You want more people to come? Love the body. You want more people to come? Don't be a stumbling block. If you want more people here to hear the preaching of the word and the preaching of the word, the seed gets cast and the Holy Spirit saves people. If you want that to happen, love this body and love the entire body of other churches. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know an idol has no real existence. So Paul's saying, listen, us mature people, we know it makes no difference and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, he's put it in quotes, Yet for us, there's one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and through whom we exist. So Paul's acknowledging right here, listen, there's nothing wrong. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscious being weak is defiled. The weak people, okay? The weak people. Well, they're weak, not my problem. Wrong. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care. It's the same Greek. Give deep thought to that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Well, it's my right. It's not. Not if you are truly interested in being devoted to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Thank you. Lord, he did not fight for his rights because we would all spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers. Again, he, Paul just said meat was fine. But if you're doing it in a way where you're causing your brothers or sisters to stumble, you're sinning against your brothers and sisters, wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Listen to what Paul says. Paul knows it's clean. He knows there's nothing wrong with it. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. 
lest I make my brother stumble. Now, you can substitute so many things in there. For me, that's not even funny. Nathan, that sounds hard. Yeah. Welcome to walking like Jesus. He's clear. Remember the millstone? Romans 14, it gives even more clarity on this. You think this is important? Do you think this is important to God? And again, you got to pick who your God is. You are God. Are you going to put Jesus on that cross tomorrow morning? Or are you going to put you on that cross tomorrow morning? Four, Romans 14, 1, we're going to read the whole thing. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he made anything, while a weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Folks, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to acknowledge attention. The church looked so foolish when COVID hit. It looked so foolish. Everybody fighting over everything. No one able to give up their personal freedom for the other person. And yeah, it's no big secret what our personal conviction was here, but my gracious, there were other people who had different convictions and I prayed with them. But man, it must have grieved the Holy Spirit to see how the capital C church reacted over that on both sides. Who are you to pass judgment? <whistles> on the servant of another, it is before his own master, he's talking about before God, that he stands or fail, falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day. Now he's talking about the Sabbath because there was a massive issue of when the Sabbath should be because the Judaizers are like, oh no, we still gotta have Sabbath, can't do anything, all that stuff. If you wanna be in Christ, you gotta still do all this. Paul's like, no, Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath. One person esteems one day is better than the other while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind or personal conviction. There are things the elders here at Hansville Church are convicted on. We will act on them. That's what we've got to be like. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord. You see the theme here that Paul's going. I get it. It's hard because it requires me to humble myself. I don't want to do that. I'm prideful. So are you. Every one of us. And if you say you're not, you got a big problem. In honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. Now listen to what he says. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Folks, when we're bitter towards another Christ follower, we are bitter towards Christ. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Again, why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, he quotes Isaiah, also says written in Philippians 2, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And Paul says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And what he's talking about there is submitting. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. And this comes in so many different areas. And then Paul goes back to, just so he makes sure he is clear on his own stance, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. He's like, you want to eat meat offered to idols? It's, it's, it, you're free to do that. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. He says, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. And there's several things we can put in a place of meat. And then he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Paul's like, guys, get it in gear here. Get it in gear. It's not, it's not a matter of eating and drinking. He's like, don't worry about that. But of righteousness and of peace and of joy in the Holy Spirit. Unity, unity of us. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved 
by men. So then let us pursue what makes, this is gonna be familiar, it's the last verse in Mark, for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do you see the theme throughout all the scripture, folks? Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Well, Nathan, what if I want to exercise my freedom? Well, Paul addresses that in the next verse. He says this, for we we who are strong, oh, excuse me, I went, went too far back there. My bad. What'd I do? There it is. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. And as if Paul could not hit that home anymore in the very next verse. Well, I'm a mature Christ follower. I know a lot of scripture. Okay, okay, great. This is for you. We who are strong have an obligation. Obligation to who? To God. To bear with the failings of the weak and not to please uh, ourselves. Folks, I I get it. This seems offensive. Well, I want to be able to do these things. Well, I want to exercise my freedom in Christ to do this. Isn't that, isn't that, I get it. It's about humility in the body though. It's about as a worship to God to surrender the freedoms and rights that you have in order to build up his body, his bride. Look at what Jesus did for us. I mean, imagine that. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear. This is not to please people. I, man, if the elders here started to please people, we wouldn't even be here right now. We can't please people. But when there is no scriptural definition that, that prohibits or promotes a certain activity, folks, that's where grace comes in in humility. And the stronger yield to the weaker. Well, I don't want to do that. Yeah, we don't get a choice. Paul's clear. We've got people in here who have sat under strong biblical teaching for three or four decades. And then we've got some people in here that that have just come to Christ. We have got to bear with them. We've got to meet people where they are. And one of the most uh, common characteristics of of the issue with this is legalism. legalism. Legalistic people are some of the most immature people in the world if they are saved. If they're saved. They're the most mature. I mean, immature Because they think if you don't do it my way, you're not doing it right. Okay, well, a lot of times I've asked her, but chapter verse. What do you mean? Chapter verse. If this is wrong, chapter verse. And again, it's just, it's going to require patience and and a radical love of Christ. And again, the only way we know how to do this is through immersing ourselves in God's word. So this radical love, we got to make sure we're not giving any direct temptation we got to make sure we're not indirectly tempting someone by provoking them to anger, putting them in a situation, by failing to encourage righteousness and by placing a stumbling block before somebody. Well, Nathan, this all just sounds ridiculous. Jesus did it. And there's not a soul in here he didn't do it for. And he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, pay no attention to yourself. Let him embrace his cross and follow me. Do what I did. Are we Christ followers or are we not? And so that's, Jesus now turns from causing others to stumble from us stumbling. And so this is the next thing he calls us to is to be radically pure, radically pure. And so we can't lead others away from sin and we can't lead them towards righteousness if we're not doing the same thing in our own lives. We must radically sever the sin and any cause of sin out of our life. And folks, we gotta get radical about it. The problem is for years, culture just wants to nonchalantly not deal with sin. They just don't wanna deal with it. Sin is destructive, sin is horrible. God hates it and we've gotta get radical about it. So Jesus uses what's called a hyperbole an extreme exaggeration uh, to, to prove a point. And so listen to what he says, folks. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. 
And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Do you think these words are pretty drastic that Jesus uses? They are. And the hand and the foot and the eye emphasizes that where we go, what we do, what we see are all avenues for potential sin. And the references to hell is the obvious necessary repentance and faith of an, ultimate, of a, of an immediate salvation to keep, us, to keep us from going to hell, from repent and be, place our faith in Christ through salvation. And so these statements, they prompt people to remove anything that might be a barrier to our own righteousness. But the, but the verb here causes, it's in the active present imperative. And so it's a constant battle. How many times do we say, well, I'm gonna do this less or I'm gonna do this more? How many times? I'm gonna cuss less. I'm not gonna look at that anymore. I'm not gonna drink that. I'm gonna read my Bible more. I'm gonna pray more. And we end up not doing it. How many times? And that's where it causes how radical do we wanna get in dealing with the sin in our lives? Because I'm just gonna tell you, a salvation that gets you into heaven but allows you to act however you want to on earth is not salvation. The scriptures are clear. And we wanna make this salvation just, okay, you wanna go to heaven? Yeah, okay, pray these words. Okay, cool, you're going to heaven. No. Do you know how many people that might have cast into hell? No. It is genuine repentance and faith in Christ. And then you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit and you enter into a process of sanctification. And so we're gonna unpack this. But listen how radical Paul tells us in the letters. It's not just Jesus. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit, you what? Put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. When he's writing the church in Colossae, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality. That is any sexual relationship outside the confines of a covenant marriage between a husband and a wife, period. Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, it doesn't matter, it's sin. It's all sin. Sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. You see how Paul says you once walked in these? He's talking to the church. And then listen to what he says. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, gossip, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is what? Being renewed in the knowledge. So the more time we spend with Christ and in his word, folks, we get renewed more and more and conformed. That's that process of sanctification. That's what's beautiful. In renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Titus, when Paul's writing to Titus, Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. Praise God, I'm saved. Now listen what it says. For all people, training us. So you're saved and training is the same type. You're saved into this to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age when these Gentiles came to Christ and they stopped all the craziness they were doing. People were shocked. And it's not because they tried to do anything. They were walking with Christ, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, listen, he's coming back. He's coming back who gave himself for us to redeem us. Again, talk about humility. Jesus gave himself for us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Are you, are you zealous for good works? And again, we're not talking about saved because of that. We're talking about saved unto that. There's a huge difference. You wanna know the secret? Okay, Paul tells us to the church in Galatia, and Galatians 5.16, I would memorize. It starts out like this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. How many of you feel like you got a war going on in you? Man, I don't want to gossip. Man, I don't want to look at that. Man, I don't want to yell at my wife anymore. Man, I want to be more encouraged to my husband. I don't want to yell at my kids. I, you know, I want to do better, uh, you know, with promoting righteousness, but I just, I just can't. It's because we have a war going on inside of us, folks. 
So the more you spend time in his word and abiding in Christ, you are walking by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of flesh are against the spirit. Desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other. That Greek word is a strong war. We have a war going on and we're going to until Christ comes back. It's for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And then he says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, it's the way we word it here. Is there fruit in your life? Well, no. Is there conviction? Well, no. Then friend, you have a big eternal problem because then Paul says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have what? Sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, we make this salvation thing such a, a pithy little thing in about numbers. Folks, you realize there are some people we have worked with for over two years before we baptized them. Working it out. Like, do you realize that? We take it seriously. Are you God's beloved son or beloved daughter? John Owen said it this way. You either be killing sin or sin will be killing you. That's what he said. Billy Sunday, the, uh, the famous circuit preacher. He said one reason sin flourishes in the church is because it's treated like a cream puff and not a rattlesnake. What is sin to you? Is it a cream puff or is it a rattlesnake? I don't want to get around no rattlesnake. I don't want to get around any snake, but especially one that's venomous. What is sin to you? Because if you're, if you're saved by Christ, you'll hate it. You'll hate it. And the initial commitment becomes the lifelong pattern. So here's the question you ask yourself. What in my life is causing me to stumble? What do you have in your life that is causing you to stumble? Is it this? Then get rid of it and get a, get a flip phone. By the way, there's a big movement, a lot of Gen Zers that are getting flip phones, just so you know. Get rid of it and get a flip phone. Is it TV? Get rid of it. Is it internet? Get rid of it. Is it the news? Get rid of it. Is it stuff? Then sell it and get rid of it. Get radical. Jesus is saying, cut it off. What is causing you to stumble? Get rid of it. Get out of your life. Is it a bunch of stuff? Is I want this car, I want this, or I want that, or I want this. Is it, is it the kid's travel ball? Is it that, I don't know, but get rid of it. What is taking you away from your love of your first love of God? We've got to get, Jesus tells us to get radical about it. Radical. If it's politics, never watch it again. Pray and vote and be done with it. What is causing you to stumble? Because here's the thing, we'll do anything for more comfort, won't we? In our flesh, to satisfy our physical needs. And the problem is, that's, I'm not suggesting we should abuse our bodies or live a, a life like a monk. I'm not, but, but here's the thing. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Folks, we gotta be ruthless about it. And then Jesus goes into something that would have been very, the second to last verse. He says this, where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. This is a graphic Old Testament illustration that would have shocked uh, the apostles. It's out of Isaiah 66, where Isaiah says, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die and their fire shall not be quenched and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. This is talking about the eternal torments of hell. That's what Christ is talking about. These are the strongest words Jesus used in a call to discipleship. Remember, we are saved into a process of sanctification. Imagine this process of sanctification. We are constantly surrendering, constantly crucifying ourselves, allowing the Holy Spirit, because we don't sanctify ourselves. The Holy Spirit does. When you're saved, act like you're dropped in the middle of that. Are you in it? Are you in it? Because scripture is clear. 
Romans 6 is a beautiful chapter to read about. He talks about walking in newness of life. And then he says in Romans 6, 22, he says, but now that you have been set free, so you're set free, praise God, salvation, and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get. So what's the fruit I get? It leads to sanctification. If you're saved, you will have fruit. And if you don't have fruit, you will have conviction. And if you don't have fruit and you don't have conviction, friend, please work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 12. Praise God, it's God. The very next verse, for it is God who does it. For the wages of sin, I don't want the paycheck of my sin. I don't. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. John, the beloved apostle, remember last week, he's the one that said, well, Rabbi, someone was casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he wasn't one of us. He's from that church across the street we don't agree with. <sighs> no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit in you? Are you sealed? And he cannot keep sinning because he has been born of God by this. Listen to this. It is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Again, who does not love his brother. He's talking about unity in the church. It goes back to it all the time. How are you building up this body? That's what God wants. Again, a Christianity that gets you into heaven but allows you to act however you want here on earth is not a Christianity. It's not. We are saved into a process of sanctification. I wanna make sure I'm clear. I wanna make sure I don't get accused of people walking out here and say, well, you're being legalistic. You're saying work saving. No, I'm not. Uh, Paul's clear in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we are saved by grace through faith. And that's not our own doing. That's a gift from God so that no one can boast. But you know what the very next verse is? For we are God's workmanship, his work of art, his poema, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus. What? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would your life be enough evidence to get you acquitted? He is saying, take radical measures. I'm gonna finish up here. I'm gonna fly through these. Jesus commands his followers to be radically sacrificial, radically. In verse 49, he says, for everyone be salted with fire. This is a confusing verse, which is why anytime a verse is confusing, what do you do? You go to scripture. So if you look at Leviticus and, and you look at Ezra and Ezekiel, they connect salt with, with, and fire with Old Testament sacrifices. And when you look at Leviticus 2, for you shall season, this was, a, this was an offering of consecration to God, of complete and total devotion. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. And so what he's talking about there is an offering of consecration, which symbolizes total devotion. Remember just two weeks ago, Jesus says, embrace your cross. Remember that? I hope you, I hope you do, because he meant it. If anyone would come after me, again, that's why Jesus said the road to heaven is narrow, and hard, and the road to hell is wide and easy. Folks, this is serious. He's talking about getting right. All of us should make a lifelong, enduring, permanent commitment of sacrifice. I mean, Paul says this to the church in Rome. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So that salt with fire is, is embracing because that suffering, listen, the early church, it was a way it bonded believers. Listen, I, I did a funeral in here last, yesterday. And there's grief. I bet you there's not a person in here who is not struggling with some sort of trauma or some sort of grief right now. I bet there's not one person, probably not one person. Maybe there's a couple that you're, you're, you've not been in a storm for a long time, but everybody has struggles. And as living sacrifices, we will be refined. And so the last one, Jesus commands his followers to be radically obedient, radically. He says in the very last verse, salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Now, what he's saying right there is a lot of the salt was brought out of the Dead Sea, okay? And it was mixed with gypsum. So it lost its saltiness. And unless it was, unless it was refined and the contaminants were removed, it, it, there's no way it could be salvaged. And you can read in Luke 24 how Jesus says, it's not fit for manure or anything. It's just gonna be trampled underneath your feet. It's worthless. 
have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And again, salt was so important that day. It was the, it was the only way of preservation and, and refrigeration. Now here's the thing, salt doesn't do any good unless it comes in contact with what needs to be seasoned. Who are you coming into contact with? Because again, we're all called. We are all called. And I'm just saying, you know, Jesus gives this radically new set of principles by which to live, or we are to be tough on ourselves and tender with others. And I get it. None of us want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't, not in my flesh, until I truly reflect on what Jesus Christ did for us. And Paul is constantly admonishing the followers to do this, constantly. As I wrap up, I got four more scriptures. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, that, that Greek word there, he's, he's almost on his knees pleading, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What's the first attribute he gives y'all? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain what? The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. How are you promoting unity in this body? God will, he will fill this place up and he will save people. When we truly get rid of our bitterness, get rid of our pride, and we build up the church, not this just church, but the churches that are around Henderson County, we will, he'll honor it. His word's clear. And above all things, Paul says, put on love, which binds everything together in what? Perfect harmony. Do you see the constant theme that the writers, that the scriptures have for us? Jesus is, is talking to his disciples. And this just hits at home. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. He's talking about the church. He's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Just as I have loved you. Wow. Whew. You also are to have love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how the world, that, that people, that's the outsiders. That's how they know we're followers of Jesus is how well we love one another. And then he's praying his high priestly prayer. We've talked about in John 17. I do not ask for these only. He's, he's praying for us. For those of us who are in Christ right now, he's praying for us. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. By the way, what's the most important thing a church can do? Preach the word. 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 It's the most important thing a church can do that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe you have sent me. You want a revival? You want a revival in America? You let the church get unified. You let the church, every believer, build it up with his or her gifts, with his or her treasures. You let all of them submit to the weaker person and you let all of them just take on the humility of Christ and you watch these churches explode and you watch a revival completely overtake this nation. It starts with us. Jesus did it for us, guys. He did it for us and we're to follow him. We're called to be radically revolutionary loving, radically pure, radically sacrificial and radically obedient. I get it, this message is hard. Well, Nathan, I don't even know if I'm saved. Put, fill out a care card. I'd love to talk with you about it. Well, I don't want to deal with immature people. You know, Ryan and I were talking about this message, and he said, Nathan, you know, it's almost like the old uh, saying, where well, there's two people in the woods, and all of a sudden a grizzly bear comes around, and the other guy, he's quickly lacing up his tennis shoes. And the guy said, what are you doing? There's no way you can outrun a bear. Oh, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just got to outrun you. <laughs> Isn't that the way we act, though? Isn't that the way we act? I don't have to outrun the bear. I got to outrun you. Folks, listen, we got to get back. Decide right now what is causing a stumbling block in your life. Decide it right now and write down what you're going to do about it. Maybe somebody in here needs to get a flip phone right now and get rid of their social media. TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram. Get rid of it. Maybe someone needs to turn off their TV, eliminate their internet. I don't know, but get radical. Get the stumbling blocks to where you can get the word of God in front of you and allow it to wash over you. And I promise you, I promise you, it'll give you a peace and a joy that you will not understand. Maybe your stumbling block is you're working too much. 
Maybe it's your job. Maybe you need to quit it. Whoa. Jesus said, cut off hands and feet and gouge out eyes. What's causing you to stumble in your life? What's preventing you to be the most healthiest version of yourself for God so you can help build up his body, his bride, which is a clear command in scripture. And let's set this world on fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Um, God, this is, this is some of the hardest teaching that Jesus ever gave. Some theologians said it's the hardest and it would have rocked the apostles. And God, I just pray that for someone here to say, oh man, I don't feel any of those things. Man, I just, I just prayed some prayer because some person told me to, but I don't feel any different. God, I pray they'll just fill out a care card. And God, I, I, I wanna be clear before this flock. God, we understand that these works don't save us, but your word is clear. It is evident. They are evidence. We will have fruit if we're your kid. And if not, we will have conviction from the Holy Spirit that resides in us, God. And if we don't have either one of those, I don't know anybody's salvation apart from my own, God. I don't, but I know what your word says. So God, I just pray if there's anything that's causing us to stumble, God, we will radically, we will radically do whatever it takes and we will write it down and we will do it. We will not have good intentions or emotions or feelings. We will intentionally do it. And then watch the peace and the joy that we hear about Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that we don't even understand in our lives. God, we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.